Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to another installment of Open Air presented by the Harvey B. Gantt Center in Charlotte, North Carolina. I'm Dexter Wimberly. Today we have a great guest. New York-based David Shrove creates assemblage paintings made in part from everyday materials that he finds in multiple geographies and especially from around his familial home. He disassembles furniture, separating wood from fabric, and recombines them as supports for collage, painting, and drawing. Traversing different approaches, his work brings notions of identity, history, and memory into question, while challenging conventions of classical portraiture. Shrove produces new narratives, fragmented and non-linear, that feel intimate and personal without being anchored in a specific time or place. David Shrove holds an MFA and a BFA in painting from Hunter College. He has also had solo exhibitions at Steve Turner Gallery in Los Angeles, Terry Goldberg Gallery in New York, Jenkins Johnson Gallery in San Francisco, and Monique Maloche Gallery in Chicago. Shrove has participated in group exhibitions at Jeffrey Deitch Gallery, the Bronx Museum, and the Studio Museum in Harlem. Shrove's work is also held in several permanent collections, including the Brooklyn Museum, the Studio Museum in Harlem, the Block Museum, the University of Arizona Museum of Art, University of Chicago, Booth School of Business Collection, and Pearson Hill Harper Arts Foundation. You can see David Shrove's work in Seeing Stars, work from the Fisher Shell Collection of Contemporary Art that is currently on at the Harvey B. Gantt Center through September 24th, 2023. Please join me in welcoming David Shrove. Hey man, how are you? Good evening. I'm good, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. So in your bio, it says you're uh, New York based. So I assume you're joining us from New York today. Where are you coming from? Yeah, I'm in my uh, studio in Harlem right now. Awesome, awesome. So um, I don't know if this is uh, obvious to people who are tuned in today, but um, we actually collaborated on our first project many, many years ago. Uh, I was trying to um, put the date on it, but I think that it was back in May of 2014 at Bitforms. You were in a group show that I curated called um, Distrust That Particular Flavor. Um, I believe that was the first project that um, you were involved in that I curated. Yeah, yeah, that was uh, right after I uh, got back to New York from, from my first residency in Skowhegan. And that was when I first really started to to create these assemblages using the leftovers of the residency. And that was one of the pieces that I showed with you in that show. Yeah, yeah, time flies. Um, we're going on a decade soon. I guess in about a year's time, we'll be able to say that that show took place 10 years ago, which is just mind blowing. Um, so for those who, um, yeah, I know. And for those who don't know, um, a lot about your work why don't we um, why don't we just kind of get to talking about the materials that you use because that was something that came up a couple of times in your bio um i know you work across different um, um mediums but let's talk about the materials you use and also i want to talk about assemblage because i think that um people in the art world know what assemblage is but people who are not in the art world don't necessarily know what assemblage is yeah so uh, when I was doing my, my grad work at Hunter College, I was primarily painting large scale oil paintings on canvas. And um, kind of my first entry into art was through graffiti art. And I was very fortunate to have, you know, be around so many talented artists growing up who, who really showed me the way um, and, and really inspired me to to want to pursue a career in art. And uh, a friend of mine named Brer, he um, kind of a famous graffiti artist, he gave me, uh, once he saw that I was kind of moving away from graffiti into a fine art direction, um, he gave me a conductor's paddle, uh, which was kind of this prized possession of graffiti artists that they would get when they were in the tunnels and bombing trains. And um, he thought I would be interested in, in using that as an element to introduce into a painting. And, and right away, it, um, it activated the painting I was working on in, in a totally different way, um, adding form and color and texture, um, dimensionality. And immediately it, it spoke to me and I, I was stuck and, and kind of blown away with the juxtaposition of introducing something real next to um, painted and drawn elements. 
and and that was kind of my first um, first kind of testing things out with um, using found material, and and then later on um, moving into my great grandmother's apartment, uh, the studio that I'm in right now, um, I started to find so many interesting things that were so rich, uh, materially rich, and and kind of visually rich that made me want to start to collect these things. Um, and so I started to bring them into my creative space and it became about play. I would start to play with the materials and, and you know, sometimes they would sit around and, and I have, you know, maybe I'll walk through a little while and show you the studio, but I have found material from years that is, that is kind of waiting to find its place into a piece. Um, and, you know, the universe works in strange ways. So I often, um, I'm on the block, parking the car after dropping my daughter at school, and I'll see something that looks like a daguerreotype frame. Um, it's almost like telling me to make art with these things I find. Yeah, that's um, <clears throat> that's really interesting. I think I visited you at your current studio back back ten years ago, almost ten years ago. I think I came there once, yeah. um, way uptown. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Lenox Ave. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. Um, and how, how great is it to actually be in your great grandmother's place? I mean, you know, there are a lot of people that don't even have access to their, their grandmother's place or even their mother's place. And you have access to what was your great grandmother's place. I imagine that was like a treasure trove of family history. Um, yeah, you mentioned graffiti um, as sort of like a jumping off point for um, for your artwork in some regards. But is that the earliest? Um, time that you sort of uh, considered yourself an artist or does it go back even earlier than that? Yeah, it definitely goes back earlier. Um, I feel like I was I was hit from so many angles um, from family friends during Christmas time giving me art books, um, people um, who thought kind of a way to nurture my uh, artistic um, endeavors at that time, um, even my sister she came home once with a um, her MC jacket tagged with a, uh, a kind of a remix of a Keith Haring South Africa, Free South Africa poster. And then she started creating a kind of graph graffiti typography for every letter in the alphabet. And I was totally blown away. I was like, I have to be able to do that too. And I have to be able to do it better than her. And it was all about having a hand style, um, a, a good hand style. And so that kind of hand, having a hand style transferred into drawing for me. And um, my father is a, a jazz pianist and growing up in the house, him and his um, other musicians would gather in our living room and, and they would held their jam sessions. And, um, and so I would listen in my room and the sounds of, of Coltrane and Miles and, uh, and Billie Holiday and so many great jazz musicians who, who they would um, kind of reinterpret their music. And, and so that would make kind of spark my imagination and, and get my mind traveling. And so in the other room, I would begin to draw as I would hear the music. And, and so I was always drawing and mainly starting with the graffiti characters. And later on, those characters evolved into um, kind of more figurative work in, in creating kind of identities and new forms and, and, and new figures, um, you know, drawing from some of those things in the past. Um, but I feel like I was, I was kind of hit along the way, so many ways kind of inspired me to push me into the path of being an artist. Um, some people say you, you are an artist or you aren't. So, um, you know, I feel like from the beginning, I was always kind of drawing and always had it in me. Um, and it just kind of needed to be nurtured. When you when you got um, out of Hunter, um, that's where you got your BFA and your MFA, were you thinking yeah. along the lines of, I'm gonna be a painter? And then you started sort of diverging into all these other ways of making collage, assemblage. And I wanna actually come back to assemblage, but um, did you did you sort of had your your mind or I'm going to be a painter or did you already know you wanted to work in all of these different media? Yeah, um, well, I was I, as I was mentioning earlier, the the inclusion of kind of the conductor's train paddle into a work that was even before going to Hunter. So I, I was already making art 
um, in my grandmother's old place, said kind of a self-taught artist um, coming out of graffiti and, and painting more abstractly at the time. For many years, I would paint abstractly and always kind of trying to negotiate a space between figuration and abstraction. And, um, and then when I arrived at Hunter, yeah, I, I was painting mostly oil on canvas. And then during my, my, um, my, grad, my grad time, I started to introduce charred wood and, um, and other wood panels and combining them in, in many different fragments to create a larger image. Um, and so that's when I started to move away from oil painting on canvas. I kind of got tired of, of stretching um, the canvas on top of the wood. For me, that would take a lot of time. It was very laborious. And, um, and so I started to work with wood and carving wood and, and using charred wood. Um, a family member, kind of an ancestor, was a charcoal burner, and he would use charred wood to heat people's furnaces. And so I felt like that was a kind of way to tap into, into a family lineage. And it also became a way to build texture and surface into the, into the paintings I was working on. So a couple things come to mind. I, I, I love the reference to hearing um, the jazz music coming from the other room and, um, yeah. and how that was like what influenced you as a kid. What are, what are some of the other influences? I mean, I got to imagine, you know, being in, in Harlem, right? Being, being, being uptown um, has an influence on you, but also in some of the uh, research that I did sort of in the run up to this conversation, you, you referenced some, uh, some writers, uh, literature that's also been influential on your work. I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, um, trying to think what comes to mind. Um, definitely, you know, more recently, I, I've been doing a lot of research, uh, trying to kind of hone in to more specific themes. And um, especially during the time of COVID where, you know, everybody was stuck in front of their laptops. Uh, I, I kind of came across so many interesting um, talks, podcasts, um, uh, some books that I was thinking of that kind of brought me into a kind of Afrofuturist sensibility was uh, Octavia Butler's Dawn. Um, that's a book that stays with me. Um, Song of Solomon by Toni Morrison, um, where she talks about the kind of allegorical language of flight. Um, Ivan Van Sertema's um, They Came Before Columbus. And, yeah. and really books that, that spoke to me about kind of things that I didn't learn in school, um, the things that I felt were left out, the hit many histories, um, whether it was, you know, talking about navigation and, and um, kind of the discovery of the new world. And because and, um, I've been certain that he kind of talks about even the idea of of exploration coming from Africa. And it's not thought of that, um, you know, we think of Columbus um, discovering the Americas and it's not thought of as, as people traveling from Africa. And then, you know, he talks about these, these water currents that were so easily, um, easily would take these ships from different parts of Africa to the Americas and, and you know, things that would just kind of stir my imagination in, a lot of time I'm thinking about, um, you know, I talked about a, a collective remembrance. And so really a lot of kind of badass um, stories, uh, slave narratives of people like Henry Box Brown, um, who, who uh, I'll show you in the slides is, is kind of a source material. And so I think about ways to reimagine these narratives that for me are extraordinary stories. Yeah, um, so many things to unpack there. I mean, particularly that, that they came before Columbus. I mean, that that book also was influential on me um, yeah. growing up as well, and some of the other books you mentioned. And you know, I think that this um, awakening that so many people of color have at some point, either in their school years or after their school years, when they start looking at how uh, Eurocentric their education has been and how yeah. wrong 
so much of that information is just flat out incorrect. <laughs> uh, it really does, you know, take a little bit of time. I think for me to like recenter oneself in the world and to really yeah. sort of have a, a different perspective of who you are and, and your life trajectory. And, and as you mentioned the word ancestors, right? Um, yeah. So I, I want to talk a little bit about um, like more more specific about your work, and we'll probably get into the slides in a few minutes. Not quite yet, but um, so this is a simple question, but a really complicated answer, right? I guess. So if someone were to ask you, like, what is your work about? Now I know you get that question, like, so so what is your work about? <laughs> well, you know, I would say my practice is 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 really rooted. Um, in ideas of intergenerational experience and inheritance. And, and that really comes out of, out of using, you know, my family's home. For me, it is a sacred space for me to make art. And um, I use it both as my creative space and a historic site um, using the architecture, the neighborhood, uh, the, the familiar stories and histories uh, really is my contemporary archive that I continuously pull from and um, that is updated with lived experience. For many years, I would, uh, I was, uh, people in the neighborhood, they, they mostly think I'm a photographer because I would, for many years, document the African American Day Parade that would pass by the corner here and, and shoot different neighbors. And so all of that kind of rich Harlem experience um, it started to, to become the things that I would to, um, kind of gravitate towards and became source material for a lot of the work. So e even some of the figures that you see today, they're, I think of them as kind of these hybrid figures. So they're like sometimes part of me, part family members and part neighbors. Um, and so, it, you know, for me, it's, it's a very, you know, rich, I'm finding all the materials here, specifically in a, like a two block radius. Um, and then and then just kind of interaction with neighbors and them letting me photograph them. Um, those became kind of my muses. Harlem Harlem became my muse in a way. And are there other are there other artists who have been influential um, on you as well? I mean, the contemporary or in the distant past? Yeah, you know, I also I also went to school, elementary school in the village, and there was a, a huge corporate office building, and that I would pass by after school that had these massive Frank Stella shaped canvases, um, and I was I was absolutely blown away by them. I would I would stare in the window of this this building um, for you know for ten minutes, fifteen minutes after school all the time. And friends were wondering what I was doing, but I, you know, I, I guess I was soaking it all in, and um, and then I think I, I gravitated towards artists who who kind of for me spoke to a kind of graffiti language. So artists uh, like even Frank Stella, um, artists like Elizabeth Murray, who was also making huge shaped canvases, um, Peter Saul, um, and then. And then more uh, draftsmen like Charles White, John Biggers, um, Murray de Pillars, uh, a lot of artists, maybe people have never heard of, um, who, who created mostly drawings. Um, and so that definitely spoke to me because drawing is, is really central to my practice. Everything begins with drawing and um, there's drawing inserted into the paintings. If you, you, you look, you know, if you spend time looking, you'll start to see the many layers that it builds the work. Um, I want to get to the slideshow now because we have several images of your work that we can look at and talk about. So we can start and get the first image on the screen. And I wanted to ask you a question that I haven't asked. Um, your, your family background, um, if you trace it back, uh, it, it, or would you trace it back to the U.S.? Does it trace back to the Caribbean? Like what's what's some of your uh, the geographic background of your family? Yeah, so I mean, I, I was I was I was raised biracial. You know, my father I have Jewish heritage on my father's side, um, a smidget of, of Cherokee uh, Native American, 
and um, and um, African American on my mother's side. Um, her family is coming from places like Alabama and Arkansas, and and really, you know, her family is no stranger to the oppressive areas in the South. And that's when they came through the Great Migration and arrived here at this apartment in Harlem. So it, this place became a sacred for them and, and a safe space um, to to start a new life. Um, and on my father's side. Um, his family goes back to uh, Kiev. Wow. Wow. So yeah. let, let's talk about the image that's uh, on screen now. Maybe you can start by giving us the title and just sharing <clears throat> sharing whatever you'd like about the work that we're seeing. Here. OK, yeah. So in a way, this is how the work begins. Um, so you, you're seeing the more process here. and. As I was talking about, drawing is really is really at the root of my practice, and so um, I, I have an affinity for materials and drawing on odd surfaces. So what you're seeing in the lower left corner is the process of making this this piece, where you see the, the end result on the bottom right, um, and it begins with using this uh, cinematic backdrop material. Uh, this black, deep black flocking material, deeper black than any paint I'm able to find. And it has uh, this absorbic and reflective qualities. So when I paint on it, um, the paint really glows and shimmers. And um, it becomes a collage material. So I spend hours painting and then I cut out the material as you see in the lower left. Um, which was this piece is called Sanctuary, um, which is in the, in the lower half of the, of the um, screen that you're seeing here. And you see a glimpse of me there kind of um, getting lost in, in the process of painting. And um, other times I might spend um, hours on a graphite drawing, which you see in the, the top left um, where you see a little hand there. So those, the kind of graphite is really slows down the process for me. And um, I might spend hours or even days working on a graphite drawing that again becomes a collage material that I cut out as you see to the, to in the top right. And it's really a, a set of experiments. Some happen by chance. And, and really, as I was mentioning earlier, it's all about experimentation for me and play, uh, really kind of playful discovery. And I'm always looking for something surprising to happen, um, which often leads me to unexpected places that the work takes me. Um, and, and for me, it's really getting being lost in the, in the act of making that, for me, becomes a really a meditative state. And hmm. it, it's kind of an alternative reality and in turn, that, that other reality exists in, in the finished work. Um, and, and so the piece at the bottom, where you're seeing finished all the way in the bottom right, uh, you know, was inspired by a photograph of Martin Luther King tying his daughter's shoe. And this is the first piece that I made using stained glass. And Becoming a father has had, you know, a really profound, as you know, um, a really profound um, influence on my artistic career. And my daughter would go to preschool in um, in a church in Harlem, at the roof of the church, uh, Morningside Church. And so I would be, I was looking at stained glass every day, but I wanted to use stained glass in a way that wasn't traditional. And, and so I found this stained glass lamp. Um, and so that's what you're seeing me holding there in the, in the, in the middle picture in the bottom. Um, and every, every, um, every January when they would commemorate Martin's birthday, they would do an exhibit with these rare photographs of him with his family. And so um, right away, that photograph spoke to me. It was like on my journeys with my daughter, kind of maneuvering through life and, and through school and, and seeing these photographs and, and then it kind of it kind of all stuck. And so that became the source material. 
Um, but I guess working on these things after time, it, you know, it's a very slow process and I'm building up many layers. Um, and so it's a, it's accumulation of, of many layers that begins with the drawing that you're seeing there. And um, the tile flooring that you're seeing below the kind of the feet mm -hmm. of the the subjects mm -hmm. that is that the actual tile tile flooring from from the apartment here. So I, wow. I, I begin to use the things as I mentioned, like the architecture, the flooring. Um, I would spend hours on the tile floor of this apartment and then outside in the hallway creating these rubbing drawings. Um, and that became a way to, for me to, to really trace the kind of movements of my family throughout this space. So uh, for me, it, 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 it was kind of a special material to add into this piece. And I, you know, I call it sanctuary and, and being with my daughter and, and family is, is, is definitely a sanctuary. Thank you so much. Let's advance to the next, uh, to the next image. And I have a question before you get started. Um, when you're approaching your work, um, are you, are you, are you sort of working through the process as the piece is developing, or do you already know the materials you're going to use in advance? So for example, with the tile flooring, did you know you were going to put that in that piece when you started the work, or did you arrive at that uh, conclusion to say, you know what, this would work well in this piece? Yeah, no. In the beginning, when I started the piece, as you, you saw the kind of beginning process, I, I don't know, you know, I work in a space of kind of not knowing, don't knowing. Um, I'm, you know, my father is a Zen master, which I, you know, I mentioned to you in the past. And, and in Zen, it's all about kind of uh, having this don't know mindset. And so when you have this don't know mindset, you're, you're open, you're always open to learn, to grow. Um, to, to embrace new perspectives. And so I kind of use that in the, the making, um, not knowing how these things are gonna end up and, and, and really um, kind of going with the flow and, and letting the work take me where it's gonna take me. And so that flooring was one of the, the kind of the last pieces to add to that. So let's talk about the work that's on screen here now. Uh, can you give us the title and tell us a little bit about this? Yeah, so titles are also become, um, I'm often storytelling behind the titles and also titles become punchlines of the formal elements for me in the work. Um, and so this piece I call Distant Relative, um, which was coming out of a, I'm a huge Bob Marley fan. Uh, it was coming from a song, uh, Damian Marley, I think uh, maybe Damian Marley and Nas, um, Distant yep. Relative or, or the name of his album. Um, and this was this was actually the first the first portrait of sorts. I call it portrait of sorts because I don't think of them as a traditional portrait because I'm not trying to capture the likeness of any specific sitter. Um, and so uh, when I found here, I found the frame, this oval frame, and right away for me, it it. Um, it spoke to um, a porthole. It kind of, I read it almost as a porthole on a ship. For me, it, it brought notions of married time um, into my mind. Um, and that could have been my imagination. And at the time I was reading about um, the narrative of a Lotto Equiano, um, who was a slave, uh, who was um, a slave to a, a merchant and he was able to gain his freedom and write his own autobiography. And he adopted a new identity um, named Gustavus Vasa. And um, people who read his uh, autobiography recounting the horrors of, of the slave trade, it influenced Parliament's decision to, um, to end the slave, British slave trade in, I believe, 1807. And so this, this portrait the source material for this portrait, I'm giving you kind of one of my secrets today, but um, is this, this in copper engraving of Alano Equiano. And, um, you know, if you look at that portrait later on, you'll, you'll start to see um, some similarities. And this is, it, it's a figure and a seascape. And I was using kind of illusions of cartography and map making um, and kind of transforming that into abstractions around the figure here. 
and it's made from tattered pieces of paper, African print fabric. Um, and it begins with this kind of reverse transfer technique. And in the process of transferring, it's, it's really spending hours rubbing and removing the pulp of the paper. And that reveals the image. And a lot of things get, for me, get lost in, in that transferring process. And that becomes an invitation for me to, to paint and draw in those areas. And the negative space um, here, I, I, I'll say negative space because looking at it uh, on screen here, the white um, uh, on the body, that seems to be something that you um, revisit in your work. I mean, why, why that process? Yeah, it, you know, that, that came out of the initial image that I was drawing from the source material and uh, which became a collage element. And so I began to cut out uh, his body and it left that void. Um, and right away, you know, it brought to mind a void, uh, ideas of erasure. Um, and um, this piece actually inspired two pieces, uh, which you'll see, I believe, in the next slide. And um, so part of his body ended up going into the next piece. And um, it was well, kind of left the next one so we can see it. Yeah, it was <laughs> left absent in this one. <laughs> so yeah, so here here is his body um, made a, a, in a graphite drawing on paper on like a Stonehenge paper. Um, this again might have taken me taken me a week to complete this drawing. Uh, maybe you know not not working full days on it, but uh, I began this during my residency at the Sugar Hill Children's Museum. And um, uh, two blocks away from the museum, I found this antique tabletop and, uh, or rather an antique coffee table. And so it had a bottom and top layer that you're seeing here. Um, mm. And so I began to, to use the drawing of, of, of Equiano um, as the source material here, and then using the kind of symmetrical lines of the found material to create the, the representation of a figure seated at a desk. Um, he conceals mm. his, his, his writing from view, and you can see a glimpse of his chin um, uh, peeking out below the, the tabletop, which for me um, has multiple registers. It, it, it becomes a trick horn, it becomes a, a third eye um, or a uh, a helmet needed in a possible future. And through the glass, there's a glass there um, that was on the tabletop. And I embedded maybe a hundred mirror tiles behind the table um, that you're seeing there. So it, it becomes a way to, to let the view, you know, I'm always thinking about ways to push the kind of viewing experience. And so the viewer, as you're moving in front of the piece, can start to see uh, a reflection of themselves. And, and there's that kind of participatory element to, to the piece as well. And the chair that you're seeing was a, a family heirloom from my, um, my mother-in-law, which was kind of handed down to us. And a friend was over our house who, who was fairly heavy and collapsed the chair. And, um, you know, it was funny at the moment, but, um, it was kind of a blessing in disguise because my wife, you know, um, shout out to my wife, Liz, who's probably in the chat. Um, uh, she said, take this chair, take this broken chair to your studio, play with it, you know? And so right away, this, this was the first real chair that I put into a piece. And I want these pieces to have longevity. So the chair became the kind of component to join all of the pieces and a way to make it structurally sound at the same time. Wow, what a great story, what a great story. Let's advance to the next image. Um, so this is this is um, more of an installation image. Um, walk us through what we're seeing here. Yeah, so um, this is a piece I, I created in another residency uh, in Florida at Fountainhead. And for me, when I travel and I do residencies, um, it's important for me to, uh, to 
draw materials from that specific environment uh, as a way to respond to the kind of evolving landscape. And so I went to a salvage yard out there and I came across this distressed old suitcase um, that had stickers of the, the previous owner's travels throughout the Americas and, and abroad. And at the time I was reading about this, the story about Henry Box Brown. Uh, this piece is called Suitcased Brown, um, it, the middle image where you're seeing um, the figure up kind of collaged onto a suitcase. And so I began to think about how the suitcase could be a container for ideas and how it could become a transport to a possible future. And so I wanted to transform the kind of previous function of the suitcase into a hovercraft to liberation. And um, those who don't know the story of Henry Box Brown, um, it's one of those extraordinary kind of slave narratives where uh, he was a Virginia slave and he arranged to have himself shipped in a wooden crate um, with abolitionists to Philadelphia where he spent 27 hours and almost died numerous times. Um, and so I was, I was inspired by his story and, and, and kind of the survival tactics that, that he engaged in to gain his freedom. And so I used, um, this became my first installation and, um, and this was my first solo show in New York called Homegrown. And um, they had this project room. And so for me, it was the perfect size to create an installation where I would have the suitcase hanging um, and by invisible wires. So you wouldn't know it would kind of floating in the room. And then I would have this portrait of a young man or a kind of previous self um, for me who represented kind of a figure there to witness. Wow. Wow. Um, I have some follow up questions, but I'll do that when we get to the next image. I'm uh, just in the interest. Keep and just one on more and just one more thing. The and just one one last thing about the image. Uh, the the red hue that you're seeing uh, that was created by putting red tubing um, on top of the long light bulbs, which created this kind of intense red hue in the room. And I was thinking about the kind of intense uh, boiling point that he might have gone through, uh, might have been involved in, in taking such risks like he went through. Yeah, intense, intense. So let's advance to the next image. So uh, similar question, so this, um, maybe yeah. walk, us through the, walk us through the page. Uh, so the title of this piece is, is called Center Stage, and it is loosely based on a portrait of Frederick Douglass with his daughter Annie, and is thought to be the only known portrait of him with any of his children. Um, and for me, it, it, it alluded to the kind of affection um, that I give my own daughter who was three years old and served as a, as a kind of model for this piece. Um, and again, using, using uh, I creating the kind of a sense of, of future for me, ideas of, of abolitionism and Afrofuturism all exist in the work. And so I'm using this um, a polished brushed aluminum tiling that you're seeing in the background um, to create a sense of these kind of future uh, alternative realities. And, um, and again, it's, that's something that when you're in front of, you can, you can start to see a reflection of yourself and, and again, a way to engage the viewer in a new way. Um, and you're seeing, you know, again, many different materials here coming together. Uh, uh, you're seeing uh, a piece of a, a, a chest, uh, a mirror there in the middle above my daughter's head. Um, and then different textiles that I used um, as collage material that I started to dip in paint and get it hard um, and was able to really manipulate the textile material um, to create the different folds that you're seeing in her dress. 
And then the shoes that she's wearing is, is, a, is a pair of my, my old wife's shoes that I, I chopped off and only left the tip of the shoes, um, which kind of enter into the viewer's space. And, um, and then uh, it, it kind of, it's a moment of, of tenderness and compassion. You can see his, his arm kind of reaching around her. Um, but at the same time, the idea of her being center stage and him kind of leaning back um, and so it, it, it also came out of um, being inspired by, by Frederick Douglass alone in, in his book, uh, Picturing, um, and, and really his conviction of um, thinking about how we needed to present the lives of, of, of people of color um, in camera and kind of this immediate intervention of the camera and, and him becoming the most photographed person of, of the 19th and 20th century um, and that the lives of people of color must be made valid, um, must be made visible rather to be made valid. And so kind of thinking yeah. about those ideas here. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, I mean, Frederick Douglass is someone that like every, you know, everyone encounters at some point in time in their education, but if you go down deep into his life, uh, probably one of the most important and and just interesting human beings of, of like the past 300 years. Like he, his life is just intense. And I think there've been, there's probably like 10 Frederick Douglass biographies. Like, you know, you know, you're, yeah. you're, you're a serious person when you're like 10 biographies <laughs> on you. Um, let, let's yeah, add, and, add and, his and, own. Yeah, and, you know, and just to add, you know, like he not only not only you know a serious advocate for human rights, he he was uh, you know as much an advocate for women's rights as he was for for human rights and people of color, um, and some, kind of that's yeah. something that that stayed with me about him as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I think we have maybe three more images. Let's let's get to the next one. Um, this is such a great conversation, David. It, like time is flying, so. We're going to try to move through yeah. the next few images yeah. pretty quickly. Okay. Um, so this is a piece uh, titled At a Crossroads. And, you know, I was working on this piece during, you know, the height of the pandemic, during, you know, the height of the rise of, um, you know, p police murders, police brutality, um, really, you know, social uprisings. Uh, you know, this was a time, you know, where... Everybody was home, stuck to the computers, all kind of collectively experiencing that moment. Um, and so, you know, I created this 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 work, um, which you know, again, is, is coming together many materials for me that makes the image poetic here. And it's again kind of a family portrait of sorts, um, where you're seeing a family at a crossroads, and there's a suggestion of of the crossroads on the far left using um, a different tiling flooring, um, which creates almost like a, um, a, a cross or an intersection there. And, and so I was thinking about this family kind of um, think um, at, at a crossroads and contemplating their next move and safe direction to take um, while finding um, solace in each other. Um, and mm -hmm. that again is, is uh, inspired of my my daughter's uh, a picture of her right after she was born um, and I use this kind of polished aluminum tiling to to kind of, again create these kind of future environments and which also became a kind of mask on her face as well wonderful wonderful work um, let's advance to the next image and um, and then I and then I have a, a follow up question. Um, so many of your um, the figures in your work, you you know, they the, have the darkened faces or the blacked out faces. What led you to doing that in your work? Yeah, um, I mean, you know, I go back and forth. You know, I mentioned earlier about finding a kind of negotiating space between figuration and abstraction. So there's always a, a kind of abstract sensibility to the way that I'm working. And a lot of time I get to a place where I don't want to show you, it becomes either too descriptive or uh, I feel like I don't want to show uh, the face or the expression. Um, 
but I want a kind of sense of humanity being expressed. So sometimes that, that is through a gesture of the body. Sometimes that is happening through the gaze that you're uh, of the figure, kind of an un unrelenting gaze. Um, and so here you're, you're seeing, uh, you're, you're getting a glimpse. I think of these oval portraits as a way to play with the history of classical portraiture um, and the concept of time to create these portals into these, these kind of uncertain liminal spaces and imagined universes. Um, and so we're kind of, you know, we're also, it's kind of twofold. It's a sense that we're getting a glimpse into a moment between two lovers here and also a suggestion of them looking out of a porthole, uh, maybe on a spaceship um, in flight. Um, this is, it was coming out of uh, reading about um, folklore uh, of the kind of allegorical language of flight, which came out of African American folklore. And um, so you're seeing two figures kind of intertwined and holding a kind of mutual. Uh, holding of the space to the point where they share the same vision in one eye and here in this in this in this kind of scene the woman has her hand stretching around the man you know i make it very ambiguous and mysterious to whose hand is what and whose body part is doing what um so that's actually her hand wrapping around the man and so in in this in this painting she becomes the kind of protector figure and she has a monkey by her side, who, um, which is the, the, the name of the monkey is, is named Eshu. And he is a kind of trickster figure that comes out of, out of folklore and, and mythology. And is this kind of trickster figure who, who becomes this kind of guardian and, and somebody who possesses a kind of spiritual power um, and, and is on the journey of, of of African Americans during um, during the slave trade and into freedom, and so that Thank that kind of sure. trickster monkey figure is, it, it becomes this reoccurring character in a lot of my works that that you'll see. You know, if you you spend time looking, I really want to draw the viewer in um, with the the color relationships, the um, the materiality and texture. I want it to be a rich visual experience first before you might know what I'm even thinking about. And are you using uh, acrylic paint? Are you using oil paint? What are some of the materials? So let's advance to the next image as well, but I'd love to hear about materials that you're using. Yeah, um, in that piece, uh, you know, there, there is a, a small piece of a textile on like the collar of the figure. Uh, same with this here. You're seeing a small piece of a textile on her neck there, the pink, pink material. Um, but I want, when I use a textile, uh, I use it as a collage material and I want it to become seamless. Um, so moving from the paint or drawing into a fabric, uh, I almost don't, you know, you have to spend time looking to really see what the materials are. Um, so there's a kind of degree of speculation involved in the viewing of the piece um, on behalf of, of, of the audience. Um, so, I, you know, in that, in that sense, I, I'm making them work a little extra. Um, and this piece um, is, is the piece in the show um, that is called, the title is Everything Flows Through Her. And this was created through um, the remains of three found objects, the oval mirror frame you're seeing in the center. And uh, at the bottom is a piece of a, a bed floorboard. And at the top is uh, another antique, um, uh, another antique mirror frame where I discard the mirrors and use it solely either as a frame or framing and devices to envelop the subject. And, um, and so this piece um, for me is an embodiment of symbols of justice, truth, and balance. And the inclusion of the, the looping pull chain on the right-hand side, um, for me, it was suggestive of the scales, balancing scales traditionally held by Lady Justice. Um, and so, she also had a veil on her face 
And here I thought about ways to kind of reimagine the image. And so I have her mouth and teeth kind of um, penetrating the veil and um, as, as if she's about to speak. And she has this kind of unrelenting gaze that, that both confronts us and, and also kind of moves beyond our scope. Um, and then we're also seeing kind of through her body, she becomes this kind of ghostly outline um, who's hovering uh, over, the, the, uh, over the sea. Um, so again, it's kind of a figure and seascape uh, intertwined. And, and for me, the, the kind of initial interest in, in these materials is that they had you know, multiple registers. Um, for me, it brought to mind, again, notions of maritime, like the, the arching at the top, um, the balancing scales uh, brought to mind military, um, maybe the Marine symbol, um, uh, you know, so it, it, you know, they connote many different kind of cultural histories for me. And so that was one thing that, that attracted me to these materials, I think, in, in, in its initial um, collection of them. Thank you. I think this may be the final image and we're going to um, have a little treat to get a little virtual tour of your space. It will take a couple minutes to do that because uh, I'm sure people are curious to see what you've been referencing um, you know, during our talk. So I'll give you a moment to, to get that set up. Okay. Yeah, and don't forget to mute. I think you have to mute. Great. You hear me? Looking good. Looking good. So, uh, you know, I'll give you a little sneak peek of a few things that I've been working on in the studio right now. Um, I'm working towards my next, my second solo show at Monique Maloche Gallery in Chicago. And so this is one of the pieces. Uh, I was thinking about the yard and garden being a, a site of renewal and sustenance and, and survival. Um, for me, the gardens kind of become, again, our sanctuaries and spaces of, of work and pride and leisure and joy, um, spaces, places to, to plant our feet in the, in the grass. And, um, and then also thinking about kind of traditional healing practices. Um, and so you're, you're, you're seeing families in their yards and gardens. This is a, a larger piece. And uh, for these works, I return to, to the rectangle format. And um, kind of what brought me there was using a lot of the fragments of, of the leftover fragments that I cut out using my jigsaw. Um, mm. And so those fragments started to create the kind of framing that you're seeing, which returned me to, to more of the rectangular structure here. Um, and sometimes the works begin with these small studies and these watercolors on paper. And they, they often inform um, the direction of the larger works. And so these, these really become great. very free, like freeing for me. You know, the process of the larger works is, is a very slow process where I'm building up many layers. Um, and, and so it's working from moving from larger to smaller works is, 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 is a very freeing experience for me because I work a lot quicker on those. Are these on canvas start, or are they on wood? No, no, these are all, these are wood. Th these are all on wood piece. These are many different wood pieces and fragments that are coming together that I'm joining um, with, with I see. sometimes I see. with plywood behind it or using metal mending plates to connect all of the different elements which you, which is behind the piece right um, and right, you can start right. to get a 
is another small little uh, a study. But you can s start to get a sense here from kind of the side view where you're seeing the, the, the right. layers being built. Right. That's great. I imagine these are quite heavy. <laughs> um, they, they, these are actually a little lighter than some of the older works. Um, and so I started to think about ways that they wouldn't, you know, wouldn't be as heavy using materials that, that were, were lighter. Um, so they're easily move around. Uh, I, I did almost squish myself with a heavy piece once. So I, I try not to work too heavy nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Well, thank you. Well, thank you for, for sharing your space. We're coming down to the final few minutes. So I'll give you a moment to um, kind of maybe you can show us one or two more things and, and get settled back in front of your computer. Yeah, and I'm starting to work on sculpture again, too. So these are kind of the beginning kind of infinitesimal stages of, of some sculptures, thinking about, you know, pulling elements out of the larger works that can exist along with the paintings. Very cool. Okay, I'll, co I'll come back to to the to the. We'll give Dave a, a moment to log back in. Awesome. Awesome. So no, that was great, man. It was really great. I, I have a, I have a couple more questions I want to try to squeeze in before we uh, conclude today. So one is like, what does this process of art making reveal to you about yourself? I mean, I I, I think that um, the journey of being an artist is. Very I couldn't hear you. You, you, uh, you hear me now? I can hear you. So so tell me, what, like, what does the process of making art reveal to you about yourself? Oh wow, yeah. I mean, a lot. Um, I, I think I think about you know being a maker. Um, it's it's kind of like soul searching. You know, every new work really presents a kind of new growth experience um, that you know makes me feel um, see the world in new ways. Um, teaches me you know what the work needs. You know, it takes a lot of care and finesse. Um, in my process, it, it, it really takes time for things to develop over time. Uh, I like things to, to, to progress naturally and organically, you know, when I can. Um, sometimes I, I can spend months on a piece and, and think it's done. And then, um, you know, for me, I spend a lot of time looking. I spend a lot of time looking and trying to, and thinking about what I'm going to paint um, almost as much as spending time painting. Um, so it is, you know, the process is, is part spiritual, part psychological, um, at times kind of uh, painting a kind of uh, thought process. Um, so, so in that sense, you know, it, it needs time to, um, and, and to, to come together, you know, and especially drawing off from all these materials, I'm finding ways to, to link the materials, uh, both visually and conceptually, um, in service of the story that I'm, that I'm trying to tell. Well, David, listen, I, it's been really fantastic spending time with you, um, looking at your work, understanding more. I've learned a lot about um, your work, a lot about you. I mean, I thought I knew certain things, but now I've learned some things that I didn't already know. Um, thank you for your generosity today as well. I know that, you know, it's not always uh, easy to carve out the, these uh, time frames to to do these kinds of talks. So we really appreciate it. Um, and looking forward to your, your next solo show. And when, when is that gonna open? Do you know the, the month or the date already? Yeah, um, I don't know the exact month right now, but it should be early in um, winter of, of 24. Um, and I okay, also great. have a show, yeah. And I'm also gonna be, uh, in this September, I will be in a show called Multiplicity at the Frist uh, art museum in Tennessee, Nashville, Tennessee. So that'll be the right, next show right. coming up. Okay. Okay. Well, 
Thank you so much. We're uh, going to conclude today's conversation. I'll definitely be in touch with you, David, just to kind of catch up. Maybe next time I'm in New York, we could grab a beer or something. I'll definitely be in New York sometime in the next few months. That would, that would be great. Um, beer and a ramen. I remember you like the ramen. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. So now I'll move on to my final words. Um, the Gantt Center's goal is always to provide programs that inform and inspire. The support of viewers like you allows the Gantt Center to expand its reach and further develop programs like Open Air. To learn more about the ways you can support the Gantt Center, please visit their website, gantcenter.org forward slash donate. Also, be sure to click the subscribe button below the screen to be updated on all future virtual programs. As always, we thank you all for joining us for today's Open Air. Be sure to follow the Gantt Center on social media to get announcements about upcoming programs. Join us on June 13th for our next open air with artist Brendan Fernandez. Have a fantastic evening.